Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Has the way that love has arisen in you seemed out of place or even taboo? My mission is to expand the conversation of love in the world. Is it possible to have deep, loving, healthy relationships? Have you ever been curious about having more than one relationship or partner at a time? Get ready to transform in love. Be courageous and set yourself free. In this show, we talk about relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham show. Yes, always got to dance onto the show. I'm like so ready for it. Uh, but yeah, welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham show, uh, Courageously Expanding in Love. And today we are talking about racial identity and healing. I'm very excited for this topic. But before we introduce our phenomenal guest today, a reminder that the Elizabeth Cunningham show is live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on the Transformation Network Facebook page and is then aired on YouTube and podcast every single Thursday. All of the links are in the show notes. Make sure you hit all the bells and whistles so that you know when everything is happening. All right. On today's episode, we'll be talking with Courtney Napier about racial identity and healing. Courtney is a writer, journalist, publisher, and liberation coach from Raleigh, North Carolina. She has written for out for outlets such as News One and The Appeal, Walter Magazine, Scalawag Magazine, and others. She is the founder of Black Oak Society, an arts incubator for Black creatives in the greater Wake County area and beyond. Finally, Courtney supports the struggle for collective liberation with workshops, essays, and coaching through her platform, Sacred Identity. Oh, Courtney, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And you, like, you committed to that bio. There's like, I'm just listening. I'm like, woo, busy, busy girl. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, you know, I, I have everybody write their own bio. So thank you for sending me a bit. But you're up to a lot of stuff. You're doing so many things and you are extremely committed to I mean this is for me how I see what you do is like this is your life's work right like this is what you've committed your life to like this is I mean it's really important work just period and Mm -hmm. also it's just really important work to you and your passion and your drive and your care really comes across in everything that you do Oh, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. I do. It, it. All of this work is is definitely like very, um, it, it's all personal. It, it's all very personal to me and, and what I love about life and what I hope for the future. So thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. And uh, well, and I want to, uh, you know, lay the groundwork for the show and really get everybody on the same page as far as what are we talking about, right? Like what is racial identity and healing? What are we, how are we diving in that today? Um, And so just talking about some of those things specifically, what do you mean, what do you mean when you say race? So that's a really, really good question, actually. And I think it's something that a lot of folks struggle with. Um, And so race has to do with the categorization of um, folks typically related to their, how they appear. Um, And so that's an appearance or an impression includes skin color, of course, um, hair texture, facial features. It also includes accent. So if you, if um, you have, an accent like you sound like you're from Spain or Mexico or something versus an accent that sounds like you're from a a French speaking nation. Um, That is a part of race, it it factors in. And um, country of origin, which is kind of, it gets into ethnicity for some folks, but as far as the more, the continental groupings, is kind of what we're referring to when we think about race. And we're also thinking about maybe you aren't from this country, but you have ancestry from 
this country or this continent. Um, and so those are usually the um, ways that race is defined. Yeah, no, and thank you for breaking that down because I think that it is something that we just assume that we know because it's talked about um, a lot. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, oh, I know what race is, but then yeah, actually being like, okay, but actually really like, what is it? Because since it is something that is a cultural construct, it really is harder yeah. to be like, okay, exactly what that is because there's really no, and and this is just, I am I am not an expert on race. <laughs> these are just like <laughs> things that I have read of my own accord um and right. so but from what I've read um uh, there's you know it's a cultural construct and there's also no like scientific backing to race there you can't just like you can't yeah. pinpoint someone's race based off of like their genes for example or their DNA yeah exactly it's definitely a man-made hierarchy so the the intentionality behind race was for the purpose of commerce, capitalism, um, and imperialism. And so it's a it's a very fairly recent phenomenon um, developing around uh, a little bit before the Enlightenment. Not that race wasn't spoken on. Like there is um, Aristotle is probably one of the first um, people who actually spoke on race in a sense of like categorizing the nature of different groups of human beings but when it comes to that construct being created where people are are making decisions and policy and, and economic decisions around race like slavery for instance like colonization those are um that's fairly recent like in the last 500 600 years and so it is very very much a, a man-made human-made construct and as I like to say, we live in a society. So when we say something's a society or a social construct, um, sometimes that's used in a way to dismiss the, the reality of race and racism. But as humans living in a human society, it is very real. It has very real ramifications. But no, it has nothing to do with um, one's true aptitude or capacity intelligence or any of those other things that um race has been attributed to yeah absolutely and and yeah and thank you for bringing that up as well where it's just like yeah just because <laughs> there's like not a scientific explanation of it doesn't make it any less valid real like absolutely of uh, phenomena in our culture and society that needs to that that exists and also needs to be addressed, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so what is then um, racial identity? So how is and this is I'm very curious about this because what's the difference between race and racial identity? Why is that separate? So I like to um, kind of separate these two concepts as using the terms identity versus ideology, right? So race. Racism is an ideology. It's it's the it's the reaction or the the result of white supremacy. So the result of white supremacy is race. Um, Tanahasi Coates in his book Between the World and Me likes to say that racism came first and then race. So you had a group of people who chose to see themselves as superior, and then in order to be superior, you have to have an inferior group, you know? And so that's how this was established. And so when it comes to um, race as an ideology, the easiest way I can explain it is it's essentially one person or a small group of people um, creating ideas about other people's lives and other people's um, experiences that they have not, in in and of themselves experience before, if that makes sense. I, an identity is very much within the individual's experience. Mm -hmm. So there is an idea of what it means to be a white person, right? There's a there's this concept of, of whiteness um, born out of white supremacy. Not every white person fits inside of that ideology, right? There's, mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, very few white people fit inside of that ideology. 
those individuals have a racial identity. They have an experience walking inside of their skin, walking inside of their physical features, walking inside of their um, family history. They have an experience as a white person. And that is the difference between, um, that's what, that's what a, an identity is. An identity is an experience. An identity is a, a, a point of view of, of oneself. And it's influenced by a lot of different things, of course, but it ultimately comes down to one's experience in the world. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that we have a lot of different points of our identity, right? Like there's yeah. a lot of like just kind of, I also like to, um, uh, cause this, these are like broader topics. Right. And so just yeah. bring it down to like, okay, what is the lived experience of that? And like, mm -hmm. and then you do have like multiple facets of your identity and then your race is just one of those facets. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So then what is racial identity development? Ah, so good. So <laughs> racial identity development. I, I love all of this stuff so much, Elizabeth, and I'm so glad that I get to even like really talk about it and geek out a little bit. I am um, so, I am here. I am <laughs> here for it. I love having this, literally, we should call this like the Elizabeth Cunningham show where experts get to geek out on their favorite topics. That should be the handle of the show. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And you will have a line around the block of people <laughs> wanting to come on your show and just geek out for an hour. I mean, it really it. is. It's, it's fun for me. And um, mm -hmm. so racial identity development is, or racial identity development theory is um, a psychological theory that was de developed around the 60s, early 70s by um, psychologists. And their their goal was to understand how a person, because we all have a race, that's kind of how race and racism works. So how a person of a certain race comes to understand themselves as that race. Mm -hmm. And everyone has a process that they go through. What they found is that everyone has a process that they go through as far as how one comes to understand their race. It's very similar actually to gender because it's it's a mixture of your um your biology. So you have you come you come into the world with certain parts, you come into the world a certain shade, a certain color eyes and hair. Um, you come into the world surrounded by people that are going to look similar to that usually. And then you grow up in that household and then you go into school and you end up in a world where you're dealing with people who do look similar to you and then people who don't look similar to you. Like some, you know, like if you're um, a child, a female child, you know, coming to the world with, with female parts, then you, um, you're going to see little people that look kind of like that you know like your your mom sends you out in pigtails and you're going to see a, like a few other little people with pigtails and you're going to see a few other little people that have just like you know long hair with no pigtails and you'll see a few little people with little braids that kind of stick out and hang or or afro puffs that kind of pop up like this and then you see little people who have little short haircuts and and close haircuts or bald haircuts and it opens up your idea it all, all throughout your life as you're exposed to more and more differences as you're building relationships as you're interacting with culture um you grow in your understanding of what it means to be that piece of your identity and race is no different so you're coming through the world and how do those interactions internally uh, as far as your family construct and then in the outer world, your outer environment, what, how do those interactions inform how you understand what your race is and how you fit inside of that race, right? And so different races have different developments, especially if you're thinking about within the context of the United States, because of racism and, and because this is a... Um, or was for a long time a majority European American country. And so a white person has a very specific type of 
uh, development because oftentimes it takes them longer to understand that they are not um, the only ones, right? Just by sheer numbers, by the way, by um, things like segregation. Yeah, um, saying, yeah, there's plenty of white people who grow up and never see anyone who isn't white. Like until right. like way later or like at all, or like j- even just like way later in their lives, right? Like I'm from, you know, 100%. Midwest. yeah, I'm from the Midwest. I think like, I know people who like did not see anyone who wasn't white until they w- went to college because they lived in a tiny wow. town in Kansas, you know? Wow. It's like, yeah, yeah. Like, I've never seen someone who isn't white. Absolutely. And that has an impact on how someone sees themselves because within the concept of identity, there's two parts. There's Mm -hmm. your self-identity and then there's your social identity. And so part of understanding yourself um, happens in community, um, interacting with the people around you. And those people can be like kind of, you know, real three-dimensional people actually in your life. Those people can be in books and in on TV and in movies and that's why things like representation is matters that's why things like caricature matters um, and stereotyping inside of media all those things matter because it's it's not just about how you see like how your friend sees Michael Jordan you know what I mean or sees OJ Simpson it's about how seeing a Michael Jordan or an OJ Simpson makes them think of themselves that makes sense yeah maybe expand upon that a little bit yeah like give me an example I mean you got you have the example of like OJ Simpson and Michael Jordan but like how would that um uh, how would that uh inform who I am right and I don't say I I don't say I as in like specifically me Elizabeth but just like a person yeah for sure so I think about um, something that you know most people have experienced which is watching local news and in my part of the country I live in Raleigh North Carolina so in my part of the country typically when you turn on the local news um, one of the first stories is about someone who's robbed somewhere <laughs> you know like some crime crime is always the very first story mm-hmm. and I have a background in journalism as well and so I'm kind of you know thinking about this and how we are fed information. And typically here, that person that gets featured about you know, a crime is a black person, typically a black man. And so me in my household where I have my you know, black parents and my black siblings and we're all sitting around and the news comes on and day after day after day after day, we're seeing this you know, order of things. You have a Black person who's robbed a bank or robbed a gas station or, you know, a DUI or something like that. That's like the first kind of thing we see in the news. That starts to inform not just how we think about Black people in general. It, It starts to inform how we fit into that concept. Like, what does that mean for me? What does that mean about my future? What does that mean about the future of my 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 brothers you know like I look at them and they don't want to rob anything they don't you know we all we have what we need for middle class we grew up in a predominantly white um setting and my parents were actually pretty conservative growing up and so their commentary about like god I just wish you know things would get better or or we could get these kids off the street or whatever all of those little kind of nuanced verbal nonverbal um ideas will kind it just begins to write a story right. you know and and that happens in my household right so I'm thinking like well I have to protect my brothers I got to make sure my brothers don't leave the house thinking they can like steal or whatever they're going to end up on the news and it's going to embarrass my family right because my parents are behaving as like they're embarrassed it could be dangerous for them um they can get harmed by the police you know, because we have, you know, these other occurrences of police violence and those types of things. And so there's like this kind of fear that develops around, you need to be on your best, best, best behavior when you leave the house, because you could end up on the news. Mm -hmm. If the same, um, if a white family is watching the same 
five o'clock news, night after night after night, they're going to start to get an understanding of what it means to be a Black person. Right. And them understanding about what it means to be a Black person, they understand that they're not Black. They're mm-hmm. white. And so what does that mean about them? Well, all, what they're seeing is, you know, the anchors are white, typically. The police officers who caught them are white, typically. You know, the sheriff who's who's talking about the situation um, nowadays is black a lot of the time, but they're kind of flanked by a lot of white individuals and they're they're using language that they that this little white child understands really well because it sounds like the way their parents talk as opposed to and they look in a very kind of like you know closely cut hair and then they're in their their officer's uniform and that kind of thing looking very kind of clean and polished and you see the mug shots of these other individuals who were caught and oftentimes they look you know they're they might have long hair they might have tattoos they might be bloodied and have a black guy and just looking very rough and so you start to understand these ideas about well I don't want to be like that Mm -hmm. right First of all, I don't want to be, I don't want my mugshot on TV. Your mm-hmm. parents might say something like similar to my parents. I wish they just get these kids off the street, you know, and there might be a different tone the way they say it. Or maybe it's a pity that they hear in their tone instead of an anger. It's a pity like, oh, these poor children, you know, that kind of thing. And that all has an impact on it, on shaping this child's understanding of what it means to be who they are based on what it means for that person that they're seeing on the news to be who they are. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. And how, how I'm also thinking about this, like as you're, as you're explaining it and sharing it is that the question that comes up for me is like, why don't people understand this? Right. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm hearing and what you're sharing is it happens little bit by little bit by little bit over time it's just like tiny cut tiny cut tiny cut tiny cut yes. so you can't actually point to you know oh well this is this is exactly this is the moment or this is the thing or this is you know there's it's so much less tangible because it does happen in those little moments every single day over yeah. time that makes the the difference in how you form your racial identity. And so therefore, you know, and we're, we started this with like racial identity development, right? What is that? Mm. And development, developing over a long period of time, right? Yes. Like years, years and years and years. Yeah. No, I yeah. think that- And years yeah. and years and years before you have any awareness of race, right? Like you're, we're talking about, you know, one and two and three and four years old before you even have any awareness of, any differences or, you know, why anybody's different or the same or so forth. So yeah, long, long, long time. Yeah. And I think that that is really important. Like in my mind, I'm like, that's just really important to get (laughs) that this this happens over a long period of time, over many, many instances, every single day being reinforced by different things. And I think that, and, and we'll, we'll, we're going to take a quick break here here and uh and we'll come back um but what I'd love to cover after the break is like you know why this is so important we'll go into the why is this so important and then we'll go into the healing aspect of it after that but um but yeah it's just it's it's really important to to start there right like this happens over a long period of time yeah yeah Yeah, absolutely All right, well, we are going to go on a a short break and we'll be right back. (laughs) See, eventually I'll have a show like Ellen and we just like dance on the stage and it'll be great. Oh my gosh, that'd be amazing, (laughs) especially if you can get a, a DJ like Twitch. Ooh. I mean, oh, oh my god that just gave me like shivers I, mean, I was like oh my god what? <laughs> like, <laughs> good looking man right there <laughs> i'm like all right ooh, calm down all right we're having a conversation all right. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay, so um, thank you for really um, laying the groundwork for what is race, what is racial identity, was what is racial identity development. 
Um, and what I really want to get into is why is this So, and sometimes I feel silly asking this question because I'm like, because it is, because it's important, (laughs) like in my mind, I'm like, this is a stupid question. Um, (laughs) No, it's not. It really is. But it's not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, but why, why is it so important to understand racial identity development? I mean, this is a really good question because I think currently we're living in a time where that is the question on everybody's mind is why why should we teach this why should we deal with these things especially if they're so difficult to deal with and I believe that's where the answer lies the answer lies is that it's very difficult to talk about and it's not difficult to talk about inherently it's difficult to talk about because I mean, differences aren't inherently hard to talk about, you know, like the fact that you have, you know, peach colored skin and I have chocolate covered skin should never be difficult to talk about. Like your, you know, my curly hair versus your like straight wavy hair. But because of what has been done in the name of these differences, what um, people have done in relation to the differences between us, those things are very painful. And part of the reason why they are still painful even in some cases three and four hundred years after they occurred is because we haven't had the conversation about it and because we've really only been committed to um very uh small movements forward while maintaining the same types of like caste systems or hierarchy that perpetuate harm and so that is why we have a hard time talking about it and that's why it needs to be talked about. And I I believe that another thing that it's related to, which is not talked about enough, is um, trauma and racism are inextricable. And it's not just about the trauma that was inflicted upon um, minoritized folks. It's the trauma that occurs when you participate in or you observe trauma being inflicted on someone else. And I'm sure you have other people who are who are um, much more informed and educated on this than I am who've come and talked about things like trauma. But what we do know scientifically is that the impact of trauma can be passed on from generation to generation. Also, the the impact of healing can be passed on from generation to generation. And so if it's something, we are still experiencing trauma around race because we have not engaged in healing around race. And, and, and as we are working through that trauma, it is going to, it's going to be difficult to talk about, but there is the opportunity to achieve a level of healing that will start to break away the um, oppression that is so closely linked and a trauma that is so closely linked to race and is something that can be transformed. You know, if we created it, it's a social construct, then we can recreate it. We can transform what it means to be white, what it means to be black, what it means to be a Latino person, what it means to be a First Nations person in this country outside of what we historically understand it to be right now. Well, wouldn't that be amazing? Isn't that going to be amazing? There you go. Right? Yeah. I yes. Mean, that, well, and that's the space I'm holding, right? Like, isn't that going to be mm-hmm. amazing? And yeah, we have serious work to do to to get there. Um, yeah. And one of the things that you, uh, you know, in, inside of like, why is this important to talk about and the um, trauma that happens around race and like racial identities um, is, I guess I'll just say it this way, is like, it's traumatic for everyone. Yeah. And that isn't, cause I don't, how I don't want this to come across, right? How I don't want to say is like, oh, well, it's, you know, a problem for white people too. It's like, yes. It is a problem for white people, 
but white people are not the victims here right and so it's a different Mm -hmm. type of healing and this is something that you actually wrote about um in a recent blog post of yours is like white people's you know healing and and this is not quoting you whatsoever um but it (laughs) (laughs) um but just like you know, being able to heal around being the oppressor and the trauma, the generational trauma of being the oppressor. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So I want to bring up like a little image of, I don't know if you remember this, but it was, I think late 2020, maybe early 2021. And this woman got raked on um, social media on Twitter for essentially insinuating that using the term white woman was offensive and she began to kind of talk about how like kind of or comparing like Karen to the n-word or something like that there was like a lot of language that started revealing a sense of um hurt or or being of or offense being named as a white woman and that really is something that stopped me in my tracks I think a lot of people looked at it and like this chick is being ridiculous what is wrong with her but I think she just said something out loud that a lot of white people feel which is it is very uncomfortable for white people to talk about being white and what it means to be white and how it feels to be white. And especially when white people begin to reflect upon their impact on, you know, the world since they've essentially been in charge. So kind of like the enlightenment is kind of what we're talking about. What has that impact been? And, and that's kind of what's being talked about today, even about the whole debate around, do we teach um, about race and racism in schools, which is, oh, we don't want to hurt the feelings of white students. We don't want white students to hate themselves and feel uncomfortable when we're talking about these things and we're saying these things. And I, I believe that you're, we're naming something that is real, first of all. I, there is a real shame that I think a lot of white people carry around their whiteness, around their race. Um, The way that privilege is set up, you don't have to confront it. But when white people are called to confront it, it can be a very painful thing. That pain is real. Anybody experiencing any type of pain, emotions around anything, I always am here to validate it. I also want to add to that, though, is what I also want to add to that, though, is their... um, it's a self-harm, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a self-inflicted wound and it, I, it's a sacrifice. I like to say, um, when a white person is essentially kind of looking at, you know, do I take off the rose colored glasses and see the world for what it is? Or do I keep on the rose colored glasses, but I continue to perpetuate a self-harm to myself because I understand that regardless of if I talk about the impact of my privilege, the impact of my privilege is still happening, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a choice, there's like a choice to be ignorant, but you can't not know what you already know. You can't unlearn or unknow what it means to be a white person, or what it has meant. And Mm -hmm. so that's a dilemma, I think, for white folks. Yeah, well, and I think also, um the impact I think knowing that and this I think this is just my personal this is my personal opinion um is I think that knowing the impact that whiteness has on people of color is the impetus for that like because if we focus Mm -hmm. on the and again this is purely my personal opinion I would love to hear your your hot take um uh, but like if we focus on the (laughs) to to oversimplify it the feelings of white people um uh, then we it's it's not a there's no why in that because it Mm -hmm. is like 
guilt and shame and all of that. It's like, well, why like go into all of that? Like why heal that? Right. Mm. Especially since white people are, you know, in the, in the hierarchy of power. Right. Mm. Um, And so it's like, why would I go into why, why, why would I do that? And so I think that it's really important to talk about the experience of BIPOC people because that's that's why that is why yeah is because it is it by not doing that it is literally hurting a majority of the population right like yeah so and I think that it's like to use a like a really simple example of just like what what would it be like if we did you know start to heal around this is the Mm. little mermaid right and like all of the videos of like the little girls like black girls watching the little mermaid like that's why right and we're gonna I'm we're gonna skip over break because I want to hear like I want to hear like we're kind of transitioning into you know we're still in like the why but like also transitioning into healing but yeah. I'm just, I'm curious. I'm curious your take on on like on that why. I think it's I love your take. I love I love the take of like why is this important to do? Um, because for starters, you know this is a negotiation. You know everybody's negotiating in our society. How do we move through the world in a way where? we're leaving behind, where we can experience comfort of our present life, and we're leaving behind something we can be proud of. I think that's what most people want out of life. They want something that's comfortable in the present, and then they want to be able to leave something behind that makes them look good, you know? They want to be important. And and so, um, yeah, there is a negotiation because usually it's like, if you want to perpetuate whiteness, if you want to perpetuate your privilege, those two things are pitted against each other more often than not. Having a having a comfortable, carefree present versus having a significant past. Um, and so that's that's kind of what we're dealing with. And I think the other piece, so what you were saying was, I want to, you know, reinforce what you're saying is the point is that part of the past. The past is the thing that is important like living a life of significance living a life um aligned with your values if you're a person especially i think as we're talking about you know in the news the idea of being a christian the idea of being a person of faith and you think about the cornerstone of a lot of these monotheistic religions which is love which is doing good to people especially people that have less privilege and opportunity than you do for whatever reason it is your job to make their lives easier, you know, and that is explicitly not happening because they're people that are choosing instead the comfort of the moment, the the privileges and the and the luxuries of the moment, and and that's just a sad reality. Um, another piece of it, though, is something that I'm just digging into more and more, and so it might not. I hope my thoughts come out clearly. Is that one cannot only love parts of themselves. You know what I mean? You have to love the whole thing because you can't leave a piece behind. <laughs> right? You can't take it off. <laughs> you, know you can't I mean? throw it away. Yeah. You can't. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Absolutely. It's you. And so coming a little bit full circle when we're talking about identity, um, the whole point is to get to a place where you're embracing who you are, where you're embracing all of it. And, and that kind of Buddhist kind of concept of, of like, it is what it is. I am who I am. It's not about being a good type of person or a superior type of person or an inferior type of person or a bad type of person. It's about being a person. And then I get to choose what to do with that on a day-to-day basis. And I believe that there are a lot of people that have not even gotten out of that first stage of like, am I a good person or not? They're, mm-hmm. they're still trying to decide, am I a good person or a bad person? Am I, mm-hmm. am I better 
than or am I worse than? And this these binaries, you know, especially talking to you, Elizabeth, about binaries and how they are they are not good. They are very detrimental ways it's- to approach life, right? Agreed. 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 Can we get this woman yeah. another microphone? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what do you, you gotta like, we are multitudes, right? There are, I cannot sit here as a black woman who's a product of a, of a man and a woman that, you know, those are my, that's my upbringing and a product of the evangelical church, the product of, you know, a Southern public school education um, all of these different pieces, right? I can't sit here in front of you and say like, oh, I'm definitely better than you or I'm better than this person over here or I'm, you know, just everything I did was just squeaky clean and beautiful and great. It's like, no, there are, there's some light and shadow to my, my past, to my heritage, to my family's history, to my own behaviors in my 35 years. But it's about, embracing all of those things and then this all informs how I see the world and that's how I'm that's how I became a person who cares deeply about how people see themselves because it took me a long time for me to figure out how I how to see my full self and embrace my full self and all of those things that happened in my past the things I know about the things I don't know about had a part to play in getting me here and I'm proud of that I'm proud of I embrace all of it it's not all great, but I embraced all of it because it, it brought me here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what I hope for everyone. Um, mm-hmm. And I really, I, and I hope that for my white brothers and sisters too, and siblings too. Everybody needs to feel that. I completely agree with you. And I think inside of healing work, and this is something that I say, is that it all starts with you. Yeah. And I, and I think what people will find in it all starts with you is that it all ends with you too. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's a really good part. That's the good part. That's the good part. <laughs> <laughs> the scary part is that it all starts with you, but the good part is that it all ends with you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And because you do, you have to be able to reconcile all of those parts of you and let go of, am I good? Does this make me good or does this make me bad? Does this make me right or does this make me wrong? Rather that it just makes you a person with a yeah. human experience. Yes. That's it. That it. That's literally it. Like you're just, you are a person with a human experience. And part of the human experience is that some things feel good and some things feel bad. And that yeah. sometimes you're, you know, doing the, the best work possible and you're helping people out. And sometimes you're being mean and you're hurting people. Like those are both. Yeah. And to deny, to deny that those aren't parts of you is to perpetuate a cycle, right? Because you can't yeah. do anything about, you can't do any healing. You can't do anything about, you can't change without accepting how it is, yeah. how you are now. Yes. Right? Absolutely. I mean, you you solved it. Like you really did say it all. The first <laughs> step is always acceptance, right? And I've, it's really as someone who works in this space, it's been um, very interesting. It's a mix of like comedy and also tragedy, you know, very Shakespearean to see these people, usually older folks, you know, who kind of are like, I mean, you should care a lot less about it. At least that's what I hope when I'm like 70 years old. (laughs) But you have folks who are like, we don't want these books to be in the library. We don't want these lessons to be in our classrooms. These are, this is not, who we are this is not you know the america i know and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's like um it's okay you know what i mean it's like it's it's okay that this exists it's not okay what happened but this is this is the reality you know mm-hmm. ignoring it doesn't change it you know and, and maybe that's well that's certainly what it is for most of these individuals that they don't want they don't want anything to change but for those that do but kind of still sit in this space of fear like what does it mean if i know 
It's kind of like Ben Affleck, that whole thing about him on Finding Your Roots when they found out that his family owned slaves and he had them take that part out of the show. It's like, Ben Affleck, you're a white man. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like, right. You're going to be good, you know? We expected as much, you know, in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, but that shame, you know, like uh, Brene Brown talks a lot about that. I'm not going to go into how shame affects us, but one of the ways is paralyzing. It's paralyzing us. We cannot act. We, can, we do not, we are not connected with our power when we are in shame. And what you said about it starts with us, but it also ends with us, that is a very empowering statement. That puts power back in our hands about like, okay, so what, you know, what's next? Uh, Dr. Janet Helms, who, who created the white identity development theory model, the last stage is autonomy. And that autonomy is marked by the lack of fear of, interacting with the past but also feeling empowered to to create a new path forward on what one's whiteness is going to be like what whiteness is going to look on that individual so they're not denying what it has been but now they feel fully empowered to make it what it make it something that matches their values and um that's powerful that's that's power incarnate yeah, I I completely agree with you, and uh, and it it's you know you're going to have a relationship with yourself your entire life, like mm, you can't yes. break up with yourself, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> and so if you're going to have a relationship with yourself your entire life, then you got to work that shit out you know, or it's just yeah. going to stay there. Like, and you can't, yeah. and, and that, that can be an empowering thing that it's like, oh, it is up to me. And yeah. I was, and it's like all of the, all of the great, um, you know, all of these story, the inspirational stories, right. Where it's just like, yeah. I started out one way and it was real shit. And then I, you know, and then I was like, Hey, I'm not going to, I'm choosing to not ever be that ever again. And I'm going to do this now. And it's like, when we all have the power to, to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that that's beautiful. Oh my God. Oh, okay. We're, we're coming up at the end of time. I'm, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I know. I know. I'm like, ah, I, I love, (laughs) I love that the show is an hour because otherwise it would turn into four hours but I also don't like that <laughs> it was an hour because I wish it would turn into four hours all right yes um, yes you have to have me back Elizabeth that's all I yeah yes absolutely <laughs> oh my god okay I'll send you an email after this <laughs> well, declared, declared right now um okay so last couple of questions before we wrap everything up um uh, my my end of show questions so the first one is what does love mean to you Hmm. I don't know. I, what's coming to mind is love means home. And I said that to my husband recently after we had really great sex. I'm just going to put that out there. Awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna say it. It feels yes. very appropriate for your show. Yes. But, it was, um, but long story short, it felt like home. It just felt like I could be my complete self. And it's, it's, complete safety and an embrace I love that thank you all right what if people get nothing else out of this episode what do you hope that they got um I'm actually going to steal a line from you that it starts with you but it also ends with you I think that's a really great way to approach the concept of race and racial identity Mm, thank you oh yeah it was good Mm. Good girl. I got to give props or props are due. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) All right. What are you promoting? Uh, So um, not a whole, whole lot right now. I actually have some stuff really happening on the Black Oak Society side of my work Mm -hmm. um, where I was, I had the pleasure of putting together my very first art exhibition this spring and it was called Give Black Raleigh Her Flowers. It was celebrating the stories of 
Black women in the community who've done just amazing things to support their neighbors and, and the wider um, area. And I want, and they were still living, they're still with us and they're still working. And I wanted to find a way to honor them while they were still here. Mm -hmm. And um, that exhibit, which started at a really great little gallery called Anchor Light is now moving to Shaw University, which is our local HBCU, one of them. And so that is open now until December 12th. Our first event is October 7th for um, black artists and creatives in the area to come hang out with us. And I'm just, we have so much that planned um, check out our, our IG page to learn more about what's coming, but that's what I'm super excited about right now. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. All of the links to all of that are in the show notes. So make sure that you scroll down, click on the show notes and uh, um, get all of the links for Courtney and everything that she is up to. Courtney, thank you so much for mm -hmm. coming on the show today. I just cannot tell you how grateful I am to have you here and to have this really important conversation with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, for every single person who is listening, uh, I love you. My heart goes out to you. Keep loving. You have been listening to The Elizabeth Cunningham Show, courageously expanding love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Tune in live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on TransformationTalkRadio.com, where we shed light on relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. Learn to love yourself and create the relationships you want. Connect with me at ElizabethAnnCunningham.com. That's elizabethannecunningham.com.